Okay, I'm going to get started and I'll try to keep an eye on anyone who's in the waiting room. Um, my name is Miriam. I'm a new face here. For those of you who've come to this event before, I'm the new coordinator working with the League of Canadian Poets um, for the Cross Pollination Series. Um, for anyone who's new, thanks so much for joining us. The series runs at the during the last Wednesday of every month from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we are always pairing a poet with someone who works in the health humanities, whether through research, practice, activism, whatnot. Um, so tonight we have a really exciting pairing for all of you with Ashley Kilovac Savard and Dr. Allison Crawford. Um, I'll introduce them in a moment. To start, um, I'm going to just do the, we have this land acknowledgement from the League of Canadian Poets, um, but I know we're all probably in this virtual world coming from different places. I'm personally working from Toronto, and in Toronto here, um, I am working on the land of the um, Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit, as well as the numerous um, urban indigenous folks who are living here from all across Turtle Island and beyond. I come to this work actually personally from um, very much indebted to the work of indigenous writers and artists from not only here in what we call Canada, but also as far reaching as India, Palestine. Um, and so I hope we can all reflect on in whatever ways the indigenous land and peoples with whom we interact every day um, are important to the work that we're able to do. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and just do a very quick introduction. Uh, I, I'm not gonna belabor it, but because I'm sure you could all read the bios we did have. But our poet tonight is Ashley. Ashley Kilovac Savard is an Anuk writer, artist, um, filmmaker, just very multi talented person who has this beautiful recent book of poetry, which I am currently still waiting for it to be shipped to my door, <laughs> um, called Where the Sea Connect the Land. Um, and Ashley is born and lives in Iqaluit, Nunavut. Meanwhile, our health humanities speaker, Alison Crawford, is a psychiatrist um, at U of T, but who has also spent over a decade working in the far north um, with youth. So I will um, leave it to Alison, perhaps, to share your screen, and we'll get started from here. Thank you so much for those introductions. And I believe actually we have the treat of Ashley leading us off with two of her poems. And I just have to show this absolutely beautiful book where the sea connects the sky. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Take it away, Ashley. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I'm going to start off with a poem called Intergenerational Trauma. It will take me many years to deconstruct the heavy weight that is buried deep within my roots before seeds sprout. This heavy hurt scares growth with intense pains I never personally experienced. This ever stunting sorrow is beyond me and my roots. It is so much deeper and so much more horrific than my narrowing resentment will allow me to see. Comprehending the deep-seated trauma that is uniquely my own is like watching the Aksarni dance around the full moon on a cold, crisp night outside of town where light pollution does not belong, and to feel for a split second anything but lonely in the dark. Um, Aksarni means uh, northern lights in Inutitu. Um, this next poem is called Gradual Healing. Healing does not happen overnight. It can take weeks, years, even decades. It is healing all the same. It cannot quickly cover your soul like frost decorates the world with its beautiful delicacy as you sleep. It is a slow accumulation of acceptance of self and situation, adjusting perceptions of ambience and self that must be protected with self-compassion and love. 
recognizing the power you carry to heal and all of its forgiving magic. Remember, there is a difference between thinking that the world is against you and you are against the world, or when you are against the world. Reclaim parts of you that grief had buried in your sorrows, seasons changing day by day. Slow down, love, I say to myself. You are making your way up an enormous mountain. A hero's journey happens step by step. You will get there eventually. Walk with kindness in your heart while comprehending your circumstances and never lose sight of where you are going. A hero's journey is happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. I can't wait till the Q&A when we can talk about those, but sort of tried to, even, even in this setting, tried to let those poems wash over me. Um, and I really, I feel very appreciative of uh, being able to speak with you alongside you tonight and um, maybe invite people to think of this as a bit of an unscripted conversation. So Ashley's going to do, she did a couple of poems. I'm going to share some of my work and I'll tell you, uh, I'll position it a little bit in a moment. And then Ashley's going to read a bit more. And I will follow up with a second piece and then Ashley will close out with the reading and then we look forward to some dialogue with you. So before I pull up slides, does every presentation have to have slides? I guess when it's an academic on the other end, we love our slides. But uh, I do want to share a few things with you that I thought it would be helpful to read off of the screen. Um, I'll tell you a bit about myself first. So I was reflecting when you said a decade, Miriam, love that, was thinking about it today. It's been 20 years <laughs> since I first uh, worked and lived uh, in Nunavut and uh, was there for a few years. And I still organize the psychiatry program in uh, the eastern part of Nunavut in uh, the Kikatani region. And uh, my, I have uh, Inuit family members and uh, feel very, very connected to the place, but I am a settler. That's how I identify myself in Nunavut as a visitor and, uh, you know, always in conversation with what it means to, um, to come from somewhere else and, and to be there. So I will pull up my slides and that might make more sense too. When I share some of my, um, research with you, how I've done the conversation. And I think, Poetry is an amazing way to have a conversation, and I feel very um, fortunate to have had uh, not just academic training in medicine, but also in literature, and art and literature is, is uh, I find it very helpful being in medicine because it brings a different um, perspective to thinking about what we're doing as physicians and, and what it means to engage with people in a medical, through a medical paradigm. And also to be appreciative of other ways of knowing the world and, and making meaning in the world. Um, and I, I think already your poetry, Ashley, really speaks to that, how poetry helps make sense of the world. So this question that you see here, where is the indigenous history of medicine, is actually modeled on a, a question that was asked by an, another academic called Warwick Anderson. And he asked, where is the post-colonial history of medicine? And one of the things that, well, it won't surprise any of you, but um, about medicine is that sometimes we just take it as given that it's like ahistorical, that it's, you know, this thing, this great good that's been delivered to humankind and that it's, um, it doesn't have a history, but it has its own history, obviously. And um, what is the indigenous history of medicine? How has medicine been a force of colonization? Um, what are the sciences, the medicines of different um, First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and other indigenous people worth worldwide? What, what are their medicines and their ways of making sense of the world and of, of health and well-being? And um, Coming to, especially with psychiatry, so coming to the North um, as a psychiatrist, I pretty quickly realized that it was a very limited paradigm for understanding well-being, meaning, um, suffering. And, uh, and, and then this question became really useful to me and, and this um, informed my, my PhD work, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But before I move away from this slide, I, I also want to make sure to attribute the beautiful drawing by Shuvanai Ashuna uh, from Kingite, 
uh, in Nunavut. And I had the opportunity to speak to her about this piece and, and use it with permission. And she talked about it being worlds within worlds existing alongside each other. And I think it's a good way to think about how medicine um, coexists with Western medicine coexists with other, these other ways of being I've, I've tried to describe. All right. So in this first part, I'm going to tell you about, uh, this was my PhD research, uh, and it, it highlighted a lot of the limitations of medicine. And then in the second part, I will tell you how it's shaped um, some of my work with youth uh, um, in light of this, this awareness, this knowledge, this reflection. And always recognizing, so I'm going to talk about physicians who wrote about their experiences working as physicians in the North, and always trying to have that awareness that I can't fully separate myself and that I am also part of that group and part of that legacy as much as I may want to reject aspects of it, that, that that's the, the um, importance of being aware that there is this, this history. So I looked at uh, physician life writing over the last hundred years. So starting in about 19, uh, oh, not about starting in 1903 and uh, there, there, were eight physicians who wrote about their experiences in the North. And I'm going to show you a few uh, exemplary quotes uh, from them. But really what, there was not a lot of, as you can imagine, awareness, self-awareness. There was a little bit, um, especially in some of the later work, um, about the context of, of providing health care and of um, health care as a colonizing um, force and um, reinforcing Western ideas um, and, and being part of that colonial enterprise. And this, this image is um, in Pangnertung, taken in Pangnertung and the Arctic. Some of you may be familiar with the C.D. Howe. It was the Arctic patrol boat. And that was the ship that brought uh, doctors in. They did tuberculosis exams. And if you tested positive for tuberculosis, you were removed on this ship to Southern Sanatoria. So it really, um, in a very little way, displaced people and, um, and exercised control over people's lives through, through medicine and really changed uh, the, the culture. And these are some um, images uh, from, from that time. And right from the very beginning, when physicians were involved, um, there was a lot of advice giving a lot of, um, so this is from the Book of Wisdom for Eskimo from 1947. And this particular um, section is about being clean and how, and, and it was just completely wrong advice too, is the, is the other uh, thing to say, but it, it really about already positioning uh, Inuit bodies as other, as dirty, as less than, and trying to have control over those through, through knowledge and through a sense of superiority. And you'll see that resonate in some of these quotes. So this is the earliest uh, memoir that I found uh, by Loris Elijah Borden. And um, so he describes here, they are childish in their notions and are easily offended if spoken too roughly. Their morals are lax, but it seems all right to them as they know no better. So again, describing um, uh, Inuit as childish and as uh, being morally inferior. And Leslie Livingstone uh, in Pangner Tongue, about 20 years later, just before winter set in, an epidemic of chickenpox struck. It was found impossible to impose a rigid quarantine during the epidemic at Pangner Tongue. Each family was regularly visited by the doctor and cautioned against leaving their tents until the epidemic had run its course. Like children, they paid no attention and went to gossip with their neighbors. And Livingston and his work is actually a much more, believe it or not, a much more sensitive guy, but he still has this idea of Inuit as childlike. Um, in, he introduces the notion of quarantine. So literally keeping people, that was the main um, for early move of colonization for Inuit was was enforcing um, life in these in these communities as opposed to a more nomadic uh, way of life. And so medicine literally helped um, with that that colonizing settlement uh, of Inuit. Two more. Um, 
1934, John Burgess, I came across a man who had lost four children from what sounds like TB. I started to lecture and produced the microscope. They saw the bug all right, but only exclaimed EE. -E. And then I showed them some illustrations and some more EE -E and EE. -E. Oh, well, poor Paleolithic folk. And so I actually even hate reading these. Um, but uh, yeah, so very similar themes and, and quite actually John Burgess throughout his writing was quite nasty. <laughs> but, um, but the same ideas that evidence produces superiority, that there's only one way of seeing and understanding uh, illness and uh, really rendering the people that he worked with, um, you know, illiterate, paleolithic, um, very dismissive. And this continued up to the present. That was the other thing that really surprised me in these, um, in these works. So this is John Burgess, who was a Montreal cardiologist. In clinics, the men would always throw their outer clothing on the floor beside the examining table. I would pick it up and would hang it over a chair so I would not have to stand on it while I was examining them. I never did ask if they followed the same custom at home and whether their wives picked up after them. So even there, there's still this civilizing influence and, and a portrayal of Inuit as, as uh, childlike and needing, needing care. And the other thing um, I found really fascinating was the self-fashioning, the, the professional self-fashioning of their identity that these physicians engaged in, in this context. And a lot of photographs in these books of them like sort of standing in this magisterial way on the land. Meanwhile, um, it was usually Inuit who helped them survive in this climate. But pictures of Inuit um, don't portray that strength and, uh, and mastery of the environment Inuit are displayed, they're, they're opened up, presented actually without any acknowledgement of permission or consent to be uh, presented. So the images really enforce um, these ideas and the power imbalance. And as I wrap up this section, the, the other thing that really struck me is how these, these, as if they could be just ideas, they are not just ideas, they actually shaped medical policy um, settlement, as I mentioned, um, and really contributed, you know, your poem, um, Ashley, about intergenerational trauma, is that we're only beginning to realize the amount of trauma that happened through medical care and other institutions. Um, the Kikatani Truth Commission has some really excellent work uh, around this, especially around the tuberculosis epidemic um, and, um, and, 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 other medically related things. So if you want more information. And then I can't wait to switch tacts and talk to you about how this has influenced, I hope, what is more um, positive and engaged work. But uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Ashley, who's going to share a few more poems. I'll stop sharing first. Oh, Ashley, did you want to share? You were going to do two more poems. Thank you so much for that, Allison. It's um, both shocking to me how little I medic history, medical history. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So a little bit laggy. The internet in Iqaluit is very poor. So the poem, the next poem is called Seasonal Depression. It's 5 a.m. and the snow is softly falling. A thick, thick fleck of intricacy that disappears in the slightest touch of warmth. I happily extend my hand into the dark to catch the tiny pieces of art and marvel at their peculiar design for what seems like hours, days, and weeks. My heart is at ease rebuilding this moment in my cold body. I am cold. I think, why isn't it melting? I wonder at the thought until spring arrives and the thaw begins. The returning sun sheds light into me and warms my core, allowing the snow to melt into my body absorbing the beautiful art that becomes a part of me. Um, and the next poem is called Holding Grief. If I give my heart to the land, will it hold grief like I do, too tightly and too long? It rolls in like thick ice fog in the dead middle of winter, drowning in debilitating delicacy, frost full of fragility. 
We are sure that resilience is resting nearby, waiting for this all too familiar nothing feeling to disappear. Nothing feels empty, quiet, and seemingly safe. Nothing likes to take time and lose it more than grief. I don't notice this feeling seeping into my roots like lifeless dry leaves slowly spreading decay to indigenous lineage. I'd never imagined a drought could happen in the Arctic tundra that is my home until I felt it reach my veins right to my core. I stand staying still as seasons change around me, letting this nothing become me as I wait for vitality. I learned with wasted time that one does not wait for resilience to be awoken. Revival of resilience begins with a cry, a release of sadness, regret, grief. Feelings flooding in not to be drowned in, but to replenish and cleanse the inner self. I gave my umiti to the nuna to not let this all too familiar nothing consume me. Umiti means heart and uh, nuna means land. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. That's really beautiful. Um, and actually just happens to tie in with a few things I was hoping to say, um, but better to hear it through poetry first, absolutely. Uh, let me just pull these back up. And everyone, please like write down any questions that you have and we're gonna save lots of time for questions. Oh, actually, before I share, I have to share it for video. Getting a dreaded message. All oh, right. Um, probably not necessary to say to this audience, and certainly not with hearing Ashley. But one of the real gifts of to to me of starting to think about the way medicine engages with Inuit is also recognizing and, and learning a bit about Inuit culture, Inuit knowledge and values, um, both traditional knowledge and, and of course, contemporary knowledge and um, the great strength that Inuit bring uh, to, to their lives and uh, that I've really enjoyed learning from. Um, so I'm gonna share I'm trying to think of the best way to frame this, but I'll, I'll start here. So, so in one of the Inuit values about being innov innovative and resourceful, um, this, this is, these are two panels of a very long mural by um, Alyssa P. Ishalutak from uh, Pangnertung. And what she did, she worked with the community. She, she drew these murals and then she had community members come in and, uh, and color and interact with her while she was drawing. And the, the murals tell the story of someone who died by suicide uh, a number of years ago in, in Pangnertang and, and it had a real, had a real uh, impact, a painful impact on the community. But the mural also talks about um, how people grieve that together. And you'll see the land is very prominent um, in these panels and and togetherness and there's a real relationality in the mural and I, I think that this to me highlights you know everything that we don't when we think about suicide prevention uh, as one example of things we do in psychiatry often it is working one-on-one -on -one with someone in a closed consulting room doing a bunch of checklisty things um, you know asking questions and it it leaves out so in this context uh, where suicide is a concern, it leaves out all kinds of other ways that people have of building resilience, um, of being together, of overcoming grief, uh, are, are completely left out if you only have that worldview of medicine. So my kind of the, the more I learned and the more I became engaged with people, there are a few projects I could tell you about, but I, I thought I would talk about Project Creates. So I, I was involved with uh, Inuit Tipirit Kanatami um, in their national Inuit, uh, writing their national Inuit suicide prevention strategy, uh, which was led by ITK. And that was really the first opportunity that I saw 
Um, and, and based on work elsewhere in the world, like New Zealand, Maori in New Zealand, uh, as one example, um, some Sami strategy as well, of people working outside of an exclusively Western and medical paradigm and really thinking about, in that case, in this case, suicide prevention in this multidimensional way. So not necessarily rejecting what's known in Western medicine, but real, thinking of that as one aspect of addressing suicide prevention and life promotion and really taking a very, um, holistic's not even the right word, but taking a multidimensional perspective on it. And through that work, I became involved with the Arctic Council. And the Arctic Council is a as you probably know, it's a non-governmental organization that brings together um, the different countries and also permanent participant or indigenous organizations um, that are in circumpolar areas. And we were all learning from each other about these strategies, including ITK's strategy. But what became really apparent, the group that is most um, where there's most concern and they want the voices of youth, but there were no youth at the table. So this became an opportunity to engage youth th through CREATE stands for Circumpolar Resilience and Enga Engagement and Action Through Story. So kind of a mouthful. It's, so it's just become known as Project CREATES. But this was, you know, across, um, you can see the website there if you want to see some of the other stories. But we've hosted since um, 2016 numerous workshops um, across the circumpolar north um uh, probably uh, we've had about um somewhere around 65 70 participants uh by now and we support youth to tell their own stories and then train them and they in turn have gone back to their communities and done different storytelling projects and these stories i'm going to show you too as an example i think really um counter this idea that life promotion really starts in a clinic. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to show you some data around that in a moment. Um, but much like Ashley's poems really talk about, they center the land, they center different ways of being um, that, that give people strength uh, and connection, intergenerational connection, um, connection amongst people. So it's, and this in turn has had a big impact on programming, on policy. So these youth are not not just telling their story, but they're really making an impact in an area that's uh, important to them and allowing people to see uh, suicide prevention and life promotion very differently. So I'm going to show you two different stories. Let me just look at the time. Yeah. Okay. Jishin duck. Jishin duck. So easily. So easily. Hi. Hi. Masicho. Masicho. Shidri so neatly. Shidri so neatly. Gaishin day qua. Gaishin day qua. Gaishin dai. Gaishin dai. We are the caribou people. My heart is half a caribou. Since time immemorial, we have followed the caribou, depending on it for survival, our clothing, our food, our shelter. My heart is half a caribou because I could not exist without the caribou and the caribou could not exist without me. I wanted to tell a story about the stigma around mental health, how we don't talk about it, the silence. I wanted to talk about social issues, alcoholism, suicide, substance abuse, but instead I will tell another story a story of my juju. My grandma Hagen was a Indian residential school survivor, although I don't know what she went through, if it was good or bad. She lost her first child to influenza. Being in the bush, there were no doctors or healthcare professionals around. 
She raised 10 children as a single mother and stopped them from going to Indian residential schools. She didn't trust them no matter how many times they knocked on her door saying they will help her feed, clothe, and keep her children warm. Of all that my grandmother has survived and what she would say and how she got through it, I believe that she would say love helped her survive. The love of her children, the love of her family, and the love of her grandchildren to be. This is my grandmother's legacy of what she has given me throughout intergenerational trauma. I'm able to stand here today and be a strong indigenous Kuchin woman. So and I forgot to say before the story uh, started that that um, is a story by JC Firth Hagen and uh, she's Gwich'in. Um, and both stories are, are shared with uh, permission. Okay, and the next story is by Byron Nikolai from Alaska. Uh, he's a Nupiat from, from Alaska. Back home and more kept going and going using no back door in the middle of I got it but a young one wants more. The stories that were told is the key to my identity is worth more than gold and the knowledge passed down is the reason we survive from the UP roar keep the will and alive ah two more slides just to kind of wrap this up so across all of the stories um this was an analysis of the first i think 45 stories but and and you'll see this i'm sure you notice this in in the films that what's important to the storyteller so they were asked to write a story 
and then make a digital film about um, tell the prompt was tell a story about living or about suicide or both. There was a lot of preparation done. Youth knew they were coming to a suicide prevention and life promotion workshop. Um, and we did a lot of other activities around that. But um, most of the stories focused on community. Uh, definitely not. There was there were a couple um, in a more clinical setting, but really the interpersonal nature of the stories and the importance of relationality, not just among people uh, and across generations, but with the land and with with animals, um, really came through uh, in the stories. And some of the themes. Um, Youth were mostly, as in both of these stories, interested. Uh, JC says, I was going to tell a story about mental health and suicide, and I decided I wanted to tell a story about love and about my grandmother, um, that there are these double stories, that there is an acknowledgement of, of pain and struggle in, in many of the stories, um, but even more so of resilience and strength. There were a lot of stories about political risk factors, especially among uh, the Sami, so mining, railroads, Etc. not things that in a medical context we would usually associate with suicide prevention. And also incredibly important was the protective um, factors and, and the meaning uh, around the land and nature and knowledge, ways of, ways of being on the land was incredibly important to these youth. Um, I'm not going to say too much more uh, because I don't want to deluge you with you with information, but I just want to acknowledge um, Lisa Boivin, who's a, a very close colleague of mine, and Lisa Richardson. A chance for. Ashley, are you? Uh, all right. Thank you for that. Um, this poem is called, uh, sorry, the internet's really slow. Can you hear me now? Away this worry with the most soothing salt water, drown my cold sorrows while floating above, moved by the current, allowing it to direct my being to tranquility and equanimity. But even in icy waters, I must remain vigilant of my surroundings as no one can ever predict a predator or the form in which they follow. One must always expect, expect this natural defense in nature defending itself for all in all its naturalness. Days like these create a rooted yearning to burrow beneath tundra, to encompass the soil, rock and permafrost and await maturation and deepen my roots across this land, this nuna that has become my home and my being. I crave so deeply the traditional knowledge that colonialism has stolen, my rightful heritage borrowed by time. The clock is ticking, I worry. Too much time has passed as our fervent knowledge holding elders linger longingly for knowledge hungry youth. Our elders, the gatekeepers that hold so tenderly our ancestral world, Keep them safe as we need them more than the land itself. And the next poem is called Crushing. It is easier to detach from self than to feel the world collapse around you. It's a catch-22. Why do I only matter once I overcome adversity? Every soul-shattering event cannot sneak up on you if you run fast enough, but my, my spirit is tired of feeling broken. Why am I only wanted when I'm whole and turned away when I'm not? If I struggle, I become inconvenient, easily forgotten, as do all of our struggling Indigenous youth. Why do we turn a blind eye to those who need it most? Life seems manageable when you cannot feel the grief of losing our stolen sisters, fearing erasure of identity and culture, all on top of deep-seated trauma, deep-seated colonial trauma. We are stuck in a system not built for us. It is no wonder we walk around snow blinded in our ever changing world that we have little say in, yet we are expected to navigate with grace, civility and a stiff upper lip against violated treaties and continual colonial control. 
As a young Indigenous woman, I carry two worlds on my shoulders. Without support systems in place to help carry the immense weight and heavy hurt, it is no wonder I turn to dehabilitating habits. I am pulling myself out of grief, out of pain, out of hopelessness, and that takes bravery and courage I never knew I held, because it's bravery and courage that do not belong to me originally, but what is gifted to all of us through our ancestors' histories and lineage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. It was perfect way to end. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to you, Miriam, I think. Yeah. For- Thank you so much. Thank you to Ashley and Allison. I loved the back and forth there. And I feel like so many themes came out that weren't between the two that are just kind of brewing in my mind. Um, so I think this is a good time to open the questions. We do.